thank you very much for inviting me up here. My name's Anthony Gill. I'm a pathologist in anatomical pathology at uh, North Shore Hospital uh, in Sydney. My mother would call that Royal North Shore Hospital, and uh, so does the government at the moment. Uh, for those of you who don't know who, where Sydney is, there we are down there. I guess most people in here know who it is. This is uh, an aerial view of uh, Sydney from Google Earth, and you can see Royal North Shore Hospital is quite close to the harbour. It's actually, if you have a car accident in the middle of the harbour bridge, you get taken to uh, Royal North Shore Hospital. Here's the sort of publicity, sh uh, publicity shot they show of the hospital. And we're actually fortunate we've got a brand new hospital uh, that's been built in the last, uh, just the last, I don't know if you have a laser pointer here, but probably don't, sorry, the last uh, three years. That brown building there uh, has been uh, completely demolished. I was actually born there all those years ago. Uh, we're one of the few hospitals that have their own cricket pitch, uh, which is that hospital, that cricket pitch apparently is on the hospital uh, lands. And you know the government has been trying to sell it off for development for a long time. Uh, we're also one of the few hospitals that have their own graveyard. <laughs> and it, uh, apparently the graveyard uh, precedes the building of the hospital by something like 100 years. And it's quite a historic graveyard. Australia's first cricket captain, has cricket captains buried there. And also Australia's first Roman Catholic saint, Margaret Mary, uh, Mary MacKillop, uh, was uh, initially buried there before she was uh, moved to North Sydney where her order is. Um, as I said, we've got a brand new hospital. Uh, just to the left there, that sort of uh, uh, white silver building. No one really knows how much it costs, but it's estimated between 750 and a million dollars, a billion dollars. And in, involved in that hospital, there's a new research building called the Colling Institute of Research, which is just closer to this site. And uh, there's a new outpatients department. So basically every single part of that hospital has now been rebuilt over the last five years, which you know is almost unheard of in a established hospital to can be completely erased from everything. You can see the brown big building there has the green sort of cover around it. They were going to demolish it with a controlled implosion, but uh, they thought the better of that for some reason have knocked it down and turned it into a car park. When, um, when they were building the new hospitals, a lot of thought they wanted to move pathology and non-important or non-frontline staff, as the administrators saw it, off campus to uh, sort of cheaper real estate in the western part of Sydney. And after a lot of lobbying, uh, sort of a compromise deal was done where the administrators, the New South Wales Department of Health, have their main headquarters right in North Sydney overlooking the Harbour Bridge. No one really knows what the view is from the Department of Health there because I'm not high enough up the pecking order to be invited there. But it's thought to look something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the patients in the hospital and the clinicians get a somewhat better view. They get what you'd call harbour glimpses. You can just see the harbour bridge if you stand up and you tiptoes out the corner. You can see this sort of historic museum part of the hospital and the cricket bridge uh, to one side. And uh, the pathologists, we get that view. <laughs> which, which is a slight exaggeration. That would be my view if I had a window in my office. <laughs> um, so there we are looking in for, uh, you know, that's our department as seen from the, uh, from the graveyard. So at Royal North Hospital, we have an interest in endocrine pathology. We're actually the biggest endocrine surgery unit in the Southern Hemisphere, third biggest in the world in terms of our numbers. But we're fortunate we have a captive audience, unlike some of the North American places where you have to have your surgery, cut your travel for your surgery, then go back home for follow-up. Uh, most people have followed up through our department, so uh, we see a lot of them uh, back and forth, and we can follow up on them. And as a result, we've got interest in that, in GIT pathology and uh, hereditary endocrine disease. So we've had like a database that has recorded, recorded all our parathyroids and thyroid surgeries for the last 50 or 60 years. Um, more than 50,000 procedures recorded in total with follow-up for all the malignant cases. And to sort of give you an idea of how far back it goes, this is the old card system from the 1957. So this patient died in 1957. And again, you know, computers were a, were a distant dream. Oh, you know, working computers in this environment were a dream here. And it was the registrar's job to uh, punch out the little spigots uh, on the side of the car so that they can be searched. And then there was a key here which would tell you what the size of the tumour is, the age, the stage, what type of tumour it is. Again, all handwritten uh, on grid paper as it used to be in the olden days. And then you could search through the database by putting a little pin through those holes uh, uh, to identify each of these tumours. And then, you know, back in the sort of... Uh, sort of 80s, late 70s, uh, you know, it, the sort of 
crude sort of uh, almost electronic typewriter rather the computer system came in and now it's obviously on sort of you know standard database on people's laptop and this shows you all about how medicine has changed here you see a change in the uh, the shift from public hospital to private hospital surgery for uh, the patients in our endocrine unit here we see that parathyroid surgery has increased exponentially you know back in the late 80s it was uh, calcium determination became sort of routine and blood tests that resulted in hyperparathyroidism being widely recognized. A few studies demonstrating that hyperparathyroidism, you know, leads to worse quality of life. And now, you know, we're doing um, about 400 parathyroid surgeries a year in a hospital up from, you know, literally none uh, 50 years ago. And, you know, this says interesting things about the demographic of papillary thyroid carcinoma. You see papillary thyroid carcinoma increasing dramatically and exponentially. And no one thinks that that's uh, caused by carcinogens in the environment, I don't think. It's probably to do with recognising people who have a cancer uh, who weren't previously recognised. Uh, and most of those people, the cancer would have done nothing to them, would never have hurt them. So uh, I don't know whether we're doing them a favour by recognising that. Anyway, as part of the interest in GIT and endocrine path and hereditary endocrine pathology, I became interested in, um, in other aspects of the research. And we're also the largest volume pancreatic surgery unit in Australia. Uh, so as part of that um, I became involved in the International Cancer Genome Consortium or ICGC project which was a worldwide sort of global coalition to uh, really as a sequel to the Human Genome Project where the idea was to sequence one person's human genome once and put it online as a, uh, as a data set. It is to sequence the genome of cancers and of course all cancers are different and dealing with that variability is uh, kind of what the study of genomics is all about. So what is genomics? I think you have to separate, sometimes the word genomics is used as a synonym for expensive, fancy, uh, advanced molecular testing, but strictly speaking genomics means study of the structure of the entire genome rather than looking for individual mutations. And it's got a few different connotations which I'll uh, which I emphasise. So, just some trivia about the human genome. How many base pairs in the DNA? How many DNA base pairs are there in the normal human genome? Anyone? Three, three, billion. three billion. I would have already also accepted a hell of a lot as a correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> and how much did it cost to sequence the first human genome? Um, hell of a lot. <laughs> yeah, about three billion or a hell of a lot. And how long did it take to sequence the first genome? Hell of a long time. <laughs> and when was the first genome sequenced? Well, depending on when you define, finish, you know, sometime around 15 years ago. And whose genome was it? Uh, everyone gets this right. Everyone says it's Watson or Crick or someone, but it was volunteers from Buffalo in USA, but somewhat disguised. So why is there this tremendous interest in genomics now when there wasn't, when DNA has been around for 50 years or been known about for 50 years. And it's really because of the massive advances in DNA sequencing technology from first generation, second generation to third generation or massive parallel uh, sequencing. I don't think next generation sequencing is the best terminology because it implies that's all there is and things won't get better. Um, back in the olden days, you know, uh, to sequence a genome you had to cloned fragments of uh, DNA, put them in plasmids, grow up the uh, bacteria and cell cultures, put them uh, in with a priming reaction and mix them in with usual uh, nucleotides, ACGT, but also some special nucleotides, dideoxy modified nucleotides which induce a stop in the DNA. Uh, so you add them in and each tube you might have dideoxy nucleotides for only one uh, nucleotide in each tube, four different tubes, add them in and uh, yeah, they would induce a stop whenever, you know, almost at a random time, whenever one of those nucleotides came in. So if the tube with T, you'd have a base pair which is 21 base pairs long and you'd know that at the 21 base pair length you'd have a T there. And in another tube you might have you know, another stop code on. Again, C at the end, this one's a bit longer, 26 base pairs long. You can run them across the gel with your different tubes there, freeze it out and you know, basically read off your sequence, like from the bottom there it would be C, G, A, T. That's sort of classical Sanger sequencing 
Uh, it's been around since, you know, really the very early 1970s. Uh, and it had a lot of disadvantages, mostly that it was time consuming, expensive, and no one wanted to do it. So, you know, back in 1971, the cost of sequencing per base pair, per base pair, single base pair, was estimated at $10,000 per base pair. And that's, you know, come off more than 10,000 fold, more than a million fold over the subsequent 30 years. We'll talk about that a bit later. What traditionally, up until about you know, six or seven years ago, saying a sequencing or second generation sequencing. So second generation sequencing has a similar approach, but you can put all the reactions in the same probe because in the same tube because your stop primers are tagged with a fluorescent probe, uh, which will stop at the same uh, at the individual base pair length. But the la laser will detect those as it goes through. So if you sort your probe by uh, by size, you can see. It, as they come through each time, you get an automated reader like that. And that's the traditional sort of, you know, saying a plot that, uh, that we see, you know, mostly uh, these days uh, in sort of standard, you know, old-fashioned care. And then we have massive parallel sequencing, which there are many different platforms out there. I know that a lot of people here will be uh, very familiar with the platforms, <laughs> but they all have uh, things in common that you start with complete genome copies. You... Um, You shear them uh, up from different ways, so-called shotgun shearing. That you know doesn't necessarily have to be done by duck hunters. It can also be done by uh, enzymatic shearing, hydro shearing, sonication. You get individual fragments, which might be between 150 or 300 base pairs, or longer, depending on your platforms, and they can be put in sequences. Uh, this is from a, you know one of the older platforms, but uh, they can be attached to a detection system. And this platform uses you know fluorescent labelled. Uh, base pairs that when they integrate in the DNA they emit a fluorescent probe and they stay only there for a fraction of a second. You can see that this sort of a readout from each of those uh, dots there corresponds to one well with a PCR sequence going on in there. Fraction of a second you end up with uh, many 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 short fragments of DNA because we already know the human genome uh, outline or broad outline the, gene, the computer program will put the DNA fragments over together, read them out, and then with any luck, you won't have any big holes in that data and you'll be able to get a whole readout of the area sequence. So you know, <coughs> assuming that there's been no errors there, you can have a readout of the area sequence. So uh, that's you know, from the Queensland Institute of Genomics, one of uh, the patients we sequenced with the pancreatic cancer. And you can see the reality is that Every time you repeat the sequencing, it's called going one deeper, but you still will always have some hole, uh, holes in your sequencing, some areas with very low coverage, which might only be sequenced once or twice. And uh, so it's certainly a quicker technology, but it's not without its problems. That's first generation, second generation, third generation. And now pretty much anyone can you know, virtually buy a massive parallel sequencing platform off the shelf. And that's led to a dramatic decrease. We mentioned the beginning in 1971, it was $10,000 per base pair to sequence um, you know, one nucleotide. By 30 years later, by 2001, it was $10,000 per megabase. That's come off you know, a million fold. We can see that around 2007 is when um, the uh, massive parallel sequencing really came online, the routine clinical setting. And you can see it's come off you know, more than 10,000 times cheaper than it has uh, uh, in, since that's come online. So by comparison, that top plot there is Moore's Law, which is really a computing algorithm to look at how computers have improved so much. We all accept that you know, our mobile phones now are better than they were 10 years ago and better than they were 20 years ago where they didn't exist. Um, Moore's Law is sort of running you know, quite a gentle slope compared to the, the uh, massive, uh, massive uh, improvement in cost for the next generation sequencing. So the big thing is that you know, now that we have, everyone has these platforms and everyone wants to sequence cancer, and there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to sequence cancer, uh, how do you do this in a uniform way so that we can compete, uh, we can not compete as much as collaborate with different international groups? So this is the reason for formation of the International Cancer Genome Consortium, which was an international effort to coordinate large-scale cancer genome studies from at least 50 different cancer types with a goal of studying eventually more than 25 different cancers at the genomic, epigenomic, transcriptomic uh, level. And there's a broad sort of overarching committee 
uh, to kind of police or keep all these things in line with certain rules that if you want to be part of the ICGC, which enables you, which enables you to leverage funding from your local governing bodies, you've got to agree to the rules. And the rules are, will prevent reduplication. It would be no good if everyone around the world is just sequencing breast cancer and no one's sequencing colon cancer, for example. Uh, a standardised approach to presenting the data in a manner which allows the data to be shared and integrated uh, by other platforms. Uh, and a bioethical framework that uh, includes you know, fundamental principles like uh, informed consent for study participants, but you know, the whole concept of informed consent varies very dramatically in different parts of the world according to cultural mores. And understanding that the investigators cannot make intellectual property claims on the primary data, but with a few loopholes that they can make claims on discoveries or interpretation. And also a primary rule point that all the data has to be openly available in online repositories to be accessed uh, uh, by other researchers. Again, with the uh, proviso that, uh, that you know, there's a bioethical framework to allow that. And that's very important because it's been shown, uh, there's a study published in Science two years ago, that uh, if you have someone's whole genome data available to you, you can work out their surname by linking it to publicly available ancestry websites with whole genome data and so forth. So, uh, you know, there's an important requirement for bioethics in that. And so this is an outline of the ICGC sort of consortium as it was. Different countries, um, you know, have different interests and often the interests of the countries uh, uh, correspond to tumours of particular interest of high frequency in that country. So in China, for example, gastric cancer, gastric cancer is common in China, uh, is one of their interests. In uh, Japan, uh, you know, they're looking at uh, hepatocellular carcinomas associated with virus and hepatitis B induced hepatocellular carcinomas relatively common in Japan. In India, uh, oral cancer is relatively common and so forth. I suppose it says a little bit about, you know, people's different preoccupations. In France, they're doing hepatocellular carcinoma, but alcohol-related hepatocellular carcinoma, so I don't know if that's got to do with wine consumption. The UK is best and a few others, and uh, in keeping with the um, sort of international rules, global rules, the US was allowed to do whatever they wanted. <laughs> um, Australia's issues were ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and my involvement is in the, the pancreatic cancer group. Uh, one of the first things you do if you want a multi-million dollar study is to have uh, a fancy logo. So they came up with a fancy logo for the Australian Pancreatic Genome Initiative. I don't know who did that, but it obviously took a long time. <laughs> and uh, it's been very heavily funded. So various institutions, there's a total amount, gave $27.5 million, mostly from the NHMRC and a few funding efforts. And uh, as you can see with effort like this, it's a massive group project. Uh, which I was just, you know, one cog in the wheel, the sort of surgical pathologist who had to QC the specimens, check they really were cancer, provide independent pathology review. And the two leads of that were Andrew Biankin, who was at the Garden Institute in uh, New South Wales at the time. He subsequently moved to Embra, where he's a Regis Professor of Surgery. And Sean Grimman, uh, he, he was a clinical lead. Sean Grimman he was the bioinformatics and molecular sequencing lead. And he's uh, subsequently... Uh, moved to Glasgow, I think he may be coming back here. So that's you know, a very broad you know, summary of the sort of people who are involved. And again, it was very clear that although um, from a very practical point of view, sometimes you can, it might be easier to sequence only patients from one or two sites because you really have control of all the data there. Because it's funded by a national body, there was a strong desire to have a national presence, to have uh, patients included in this study from every, uh, every capital city in Australia. And the timeline was that we first started publishing, uh, we first started collecting patients in 2009, although sequencing didn't start uh, until a year or two later. And uh, that, that collection process, we learned a lot about, you know, the processes, the immense process involved in getting ethics approvals from each of these individual sites uh, for a project which at that time no one had really done, you know, this degree of uh, next generation sequencing in Australia in sort of a semi-routine setting. And we also learned a lot about specimen quality assurance that previously we'd waste a lot of money collecting consenting patients for material which subsequently was proven not to be cancer at all. 
as we went through to October 2012, we published the first uh, publication in Nature, which was an exome paper looking at the exomes of cancer, and that's been expanded now to whole genomes, which was published earlier this year. And I said there's a plan to do genome, exome, transcriptome, and epigenome sequencing. And as of, this is actually about a year old, this slide, there are 600 patients uh, recruited and analysed, uh, of which now 400 were compliant with all the rules, the quality assurance compliance that we require to fulfil the ICGC criteria. And our goal and our funding was for 400 <coughs> patients. So that's what's been completed. And from those patients, it was thought that it would be a good idea to um, Maximize, maximize the use you get from this you know, in incredibly expensive sequencing the DNA of all these cancers by creating other resources. So 90 of them have been xenografted and there's more than 15 cell lines. And the basic plan was to say that pancreatic cancer will fall into different genomic categories and have a couple of xenografts and cell lines for each category uh, to, um, to experiment with. And you can see from the numbers the great uh, Majority of them actually were from two hospitals in North Shore, or Maitland Road from North Shore, from my institution, and uh, from Liverpool, which is another hospital in Sydney. But uh, we certainly did more than lip service to uh, make sure that patients from uh, a number of major centres right the way around Australia were represented. And it's been considered a successful project by the funders of the NHMRC. In fact, when there was an independent review of the McEwen, the McEwen review of the NHMRC funding, it was highlighted as uh, as a worthwhile project because of its collaborative nature, um, despite the significant ex expense. And it's been published quite widely, including, I think, three or four publications in Nature Proceedings, you know, in quite high impact journals. And you can see that um, the data's been made available. So this is the ICGC data portal, and there are various degrees of access. You know, anyone who's an ICGC member can basically go straight to the data uh, portal and download most of the data and for data which is potentially identifying and you know, needs has privacy issues, there are ways to access and a straightforward governance process. So uh, the paper you know, we published has been cited in Nature and Whole Exomes has been cited 400 times, but it's been used in about a thousand other projects uh, going forward because the data is now sort of in the open access. They sort of download the data from that website. And it's also been placed into other <coughs> openly available uh, uh, resources, including, you know, the, this is from the Queensland Centre of Medical Genomics, that Sean Grimmanskou, who did a lot of the physical data sequencing and data analysis, but also things like Cosmic and other online databases that are readily available. So it's been successful and they've produced a lot of data, but what have I learnt from my involvement in the APGI ICGC? As I said, uh, you know, I don't want to take credit for all this because I'm just a working pathologist who's doing this as part of a wider group. Uh, who's leading it, but what have I learned as a pathologist in routine clinical practice that is worthwhile or interesting or changes my appreciation of how we do things and how we should do things. The first thing I learned uh, is that all cancers have different frequencies of mutations. This is a paper to which uh, the APGI contributed uh, data uh, that was led from uh, the Sanger Institute in the UK. Uh, and it's been, a hard, it's been one of the most highly cited uh, research papers in the medical literature uh, for the last two years. The senior authors were Serena Nixaniel and Lud Alexandrov, and uh, they proposed the concept of mutational frequency and mutational signatures in cancer. So what does that mean? This is, uh, you know, when you give a few lectures, there's a couple of diagrams that, or images that always get cited and requoted and requoted and requoted. And this is one of those um, images that will come up again and again in a lot of talks uh, in genomics and continues to come up in a lot of papers, sometimes called an Alexandrovogram. But basically, this looks at the different frequencies of mutations across the whole uh, genome in different cancers. So you can see uh, there are some cancers. This is logarithmic scale. So there are some cancers to the right, such as the melanoma, that have a whole lot of large numbers of mutations where there are some cancers to the left that have very few mutations. And I suppose it's no surprise a lot of paediatric tumours, pilocytic astrocytoma, leukaemia, metalloblastoma, neuroblastoma, they're relatively simple, probably because you get those uh, cancers just by dumb luck, by you know, poor fortune. Whereas to the right, there's a lot of cancers that are caused by repeated exposure to carcinogens, such as melanoma, lung cancer, gastric cancer, uh, 
colorectal cancer, I don't know whether you could say carcinogens, but <coughs> certainly lifestyle factors. And all these tumors are very, very complex, which uh, we all know that, say, sun exposure causes melanoma, but it's repeated sun exposure over many, many, many years that leads to that. Cigarette smoking causes lung cancer, but it's repeated smoking over many years. So it's clear that before you develop one of these high mutate, highly mutated cancers, you must have a lot of mutations already there. And that has kind of revolutionized our understanding of the field effect. When I was a medical student, we used to talk about a field effect. We'd say, well, bladder, bladder cancer is well known to having multiple different bladder cancers all throughout the bladder. And that's a field effect because the whole field's been changed. Perhaps the cells talk to each other or move around there. And it's revolutionized our understanding because we now know that it's not a field effect, it's just that that whole bladder has had repeated exposure to carcinogens and even the biologically or the morphologically benign areas have accumulated a lot of mutations and they're a lot of the way to cancer, only a few more mutations will give you cancer. We've known for a long time that once you get one melanoma you're likely to get another and that's because your whole skin has been opposed, exposed to carcinogens. So that explains a lot about the understanding of the field effects. The next thing, which is you know, really quite hardcore bioinformatics, is that cancers can be classified by different mutation signatures. So as a working surgical pathologist, you know, I classify by cancers by what organ they come from and uh, what they look like under the microscope. And that's what we've done for 100 years. Uh, with the advent of molecular testing, you think you can be clever and say, we'll classify by what organ they come from, what they look like under the microscope, and what mutations they have in them, because we all know cancer is caused by mutations. If you'd asked me eight years ago what causes cancer, I'd say, what's well, mutations in the DNA? They lead to uncontrolled growth, and that leads to the cells taking off and uh, overgrowing the patient. And that's only part of the, the, the truth. I now appreciate the cancers are caused by somatic mutations and genomic instability, the ability to develop more mutations which implies the ability to escape targeted drugs by developing more mutations uh, to overcome those pathways. And this genomic instability, this pattern of mutations in different cancers is not random. It fits into certain signatures, which I'll just try to explain. So we all know there's only four base pairs in DNA, C, A, T, and G. And if you say that swapping a C for an A is kind of the same thing as swapping an A for a C, if there's only four base pairs in DNA, there are only six possible types of base pair substitutions or six possible types of point mutation that you can get in DNA. It's a bit like saying if you had four teams in a you know, cricket tournament, there would be six games and every team would play each other. Uh, so there are only six possible types of uh, substitutions in DNA. But the types of substitutions can be further classified based on the nucleotides on either side. So this is the only thing that's a little bit complex, that uh, C for T, if you have an AT on one, each side, is a little bit different to C to T with an AC on each side. So you have the second example, uh, C to T is a fundamental substitution, but it's a bit different if you've got an A on either side than if you've got a T on one side and an A on the other side. So if you do the maths, taking this into account with base pairs on either side helping to classify, there's only a total of 96 different substitutions that you can get in simple substitution mutations. 96 substitutions by which base pair substitutes by which base pair and classified by what base pair is on either side. So how do you express that in a whole genome which is 3 billion, but may even be more than 3 billion uh, if you have a cancer genome which might be aneuploid, might have different subclones. Well this is one way of expressing it uh, into sort of signature diagrams and you can see at the top you have the different substitutions, C to A, C to G, C to T in red, uh, T to A, T to G, T to G, T to C, G to G. And then you have uh, the underlying points where each of those lines is subclassified into the different base, the 16 different combinations of base pairs on either side. So we can look at the whole genome now and then just estimate in a simple graphical format what uh, what uh, mutations occur most commonly. So if you look down at signature one on the bottom there, that is characterized by a C swapping for T with any nucleotide on one side 
and a G on the other side. So you can see here C for T, that's where the red is uh, dominant there, and there are four peaks. That's because all of them have G on one side and different nucleotides, and those four dominate. And it turns out that this signature is associated with deamination, which is a process which occurs with normal aging. So what's the mutational force or the genomic signature pushing things that way? It is the aging process with deamination. Signature two, there's been a lot of interest in recently for a variety of reasons. Uh, that's up here. And you can see that there are just two clear peaks here. Uh, the black two arrows and the red two arrows. And that means C for T and a C for G, but only with a T analog on T uh, base pair on one side and any base pair on the other side. And that was of great interest to the biological uh, uh, researchers because that's the same signature involved in what's called the APOBEC pathway. APOBEC is a pathway present in normal cells and helps normal cells defend themselves from viral attack. The idea is the virus comes into the cell, what does the cell to try to do? It tries to induce mutations into the virus to kill it. Uh, and the fact that these signatures are the same in the DNA as APOBEC introduces into the viral, uh, the viral DNA uh, has made people think that maybe these are either virus related or what may be more likely a side effect or sort of friendly fire from the body's own defence against viruses that for whatever reason, maybe not to do with viruses, starts attacking the own DNA. Signature 3 is more like equal across the genome and that's been associated with homologous recombination repair deficiency which is sort of the BRCA1, BRCA2 enzymes. They're involved in repairing base pairs with this sort of homologous uh, deficit. Uh, signature 6 is say C, substituting for T, that's associated with microsatellite instability as you see in some colon cancers. Signature D you can see uh, is a C substituting for A and that's the signature associated with smoking. So smoking I think everyone recognises causes mutations in DNA but the cigarette smokes and the carcinogens in that don't induce DNA mutations in a random fashion, they preferentially uh, induce C for A substitution. Signature 7 is caused by ultraviolet light in the same manner that you know, UV light we all know causes skin cancer, but it doesn't cause the same mutations that it causes stereotypical patterns of injuries. Uh, so if you look at pancreatic cancer, there are four mutations that uh, dominate. Deamination, uh, which is sort of the aging pathway, apobec, which is the uh, viral defence pathway, BRCA, which is the hemolysis recombination repair pathway, and microcellular instability. And the only thing to bear in mind is that Cancers may not just have one mutational signature, they ha may have many mutational signatures overlapping each other. So you can have both the age and the smoking and the apabic signature within your three million base pairs. And so it takes quite high level computing ability to un unmask them all and put them into signatures. So you can classify cancers now, not based solely on what organ they affect, not based solely on what um, they look like under the microscope, not based solely on what mutations or what genes are mutated, but now on the pattern of injury to the entire genome, which includes both the non-coding and the coding DNA. And so if you look at uh, you know, our area of interest, you know, pancreatic cancer, I said apobec, brachinus, mismatch repair deficiency, but if you look at some of the others, it makes sense that melanoma has age, we know melanoma is more common in people at old age, but it also has a UV signature. Lung cancer age, or we know lung cancer is more common in old age. It also has the smoking signature. It also has the age, uh, it also has the um, apobec signature. So that's just a new way of classifying uh, uh, cancers based on you know, hardcore bioinformatics rather than sort of a more traditional approach. And that's been uh, you know, kind of widely adopted now so that whenever someone's publishing um, a new whole genome data set of sequencing cancer, they always put it into a signature. They always say, well, this signature dominate or that signature dominates. That's what that means. Next thing I learned is that pancreatic cancer is a highly heterogeneous malignancy. So we think of breast cancer, luminal A, luminal B, basal like uh, HER2 enriched. Pancreatic cancer defies being put into those neat blocks. So how do you kind of convey how complex pancreatic cancer is? And that can be hard to do. This is a word port where basically the bigger the size of the gene written out there, the bigger the size of the word, 
the more common these mutations are in pancreatic cancer. So you can see KRAS is really common. And then CDKN2A, which occurs with P16, SMAD4, P53, and a couple of others are really common. But if you look around the field, there are many, many, many genes mutated in only a very low incidence. And we, it's hard to know what's a driver mutation and what's a passenger mutation, but it's also genuinely hard to convey that information in any other way than giving someone a hard drive with a couple of terabytes of data on it. So, you know, one approach that's been popularised is the CIRCOS plot. This is just one way of, you know, conveying that information where you have the base pair sequence around the outside, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to X and Y. And you can see the lines in the middle represent translocations, uh, dark blue translocations, intrachromosomal rearrangements if they're paler blue, deletions if they're green. And you can list, you know, sample somatic mutations and fusion transcripts on one side. But fundamentally, looking at that CIRCOS plot, you can see there's a lot of lines in the middle, so it's a complex genome. And so here's some CIRCOS plots of the pancreatic cancer cohort, and you can see that some of them just stand out as having a lot of lines. I know it doesn't protect very well, but some of them clearly have a lot of lines, and you can just say, well, they're really complex. And they're way to the right of the Alexandropogran, complex genomes, and some of them only have a couple of lines, and they're really simplex. And in some ways, that's more important than what genes are actually mutated. And I'll try and explain that at the very end. Uh, pancreatic cancer can therefore be classified into four major groups based on structural variations of the chromosome. So remember I said before, well, pancreatic cancer defies categorization into simple groups based on gene expression. Well, uh, the group um, uh, proposed that maybe not looking at gene expression, not looking at mutations, but looking at just the basic complexity of um, of the pancreas, of the genomes, you can put them into four groups. And the groups would be, you know, on one side, less than 50 structural variations, pretty simple. Here, 5,200, that's a little bit of a complex circle plot, circle plot. Here, greater than 200 structural variations, that's unstable, there's a lot of action there. And here we have what we call locally rearranged, where there's just one or two chromosomes where there's a lot going on. So, not many changes, quite a few changes, lots of changes, changes only in one chromosome, four simple groups. And you know, does that have any relevance in routine clinical practice? Well, there's been a lot of interest in homologous recombination repair, deficiency in targeting that in breast cancer, prostate cancer, and now pancreatic cancer, and now recently, probably gastric cancer. I think everyone's heard of BRCA1, BRCA2, there are genes associated with hereditary breast cancer. They account for about 5% of breast cancer. BRCA1 performs homologous recombination repair deficiencies. So you've got a BRCA1 mutated cancer it cannot perform homologous recombination repair. So we know that existing chemotherapeutic agents like platinum and mitomycin, mitomycin C induce double-stranded breaks in the DNA. And because these tumours can't repair these double-stranded breaks, they should be susceptible to, to platinum and mitomycin C because that's their main genomic driver forcing more mutations into the genome. There's a new class of drugs, PARP inhibitors, they're a family of enzyme parts needed to repair double stranded breaks in DNA, which is the same thing that, uh, that uh, BRCA is involved in, which is deficient. We know that platinum and mitomycin C induce double stranded breaks in DNA, so you would think that PARP inhibitors combined with platinum would work, but would work well in tumours that cannot perform this recombination repair pathway. So, how do you identify patients who have this recombination repair pathway? Well, We've proposed, it's pretty simple, if you look at this plot here, this really complex one, this really complex one, uh, probably this really complex one as well, will have repairs in the combination repair pathway because they're so complex. So that one, but not that one. And uh, they should respond to platinum and mitomycin C. That can be expressed in a cell culture model. You can see, you know, here a very complex, you know, genome. Given cisplatinum, it's not growing at all. Given mitomycin C, it's shrinking. Whereas here's a more simple genome not responding. But more importantly, in patients, it seems to hold out. So here's a patient from the APGI cohort with pancreatic cancer. Um, they had definitive surgery there. And this is a tumor marker, CA1919, that, that goes up when pancreatic cancer recurs. So basically, surgery here, quite a long time period of almost two years, had a met detected had a repeat liver met, which is actually a very unusual thing to do for pancreatic cancer. 
CR19 normalized and then went you know, virtually off the charts as a tumor recurred. Here is tumor in the pancreatic bed recurring. By this time, so three years down the track, all the sequencing data was in and it was known that this patient had defects in the homologous recombination repair pathway. It was known this patient had a very complex uh, genome. So uh, this patient was given uh, platinum-based chemotherapy, which is not standard of care for pancreatic cancer. Most people get gemcitabine. And you can see the CA199 normalized, oh, and the patient went into, um, into uh, complete remission. And actually survived, uh, survived at least five years after, uh, after surgery. Now, uh, the next thing is that everyone talks about uh, personalised medicine, but uh, applying it in a routine, you know, clinical setting can be really, really difficult. And this is the data from the IMPACT trial, which is published in Clinical Cancer Research. Again, I was just, you know, one of the many pathologists uh, who were involved in this project. Adrian Moray is here. She was also involved. Um, and the IMPACT trial was, you know, the first attempt to see whether we can impact in a randomised trial fashion on clinical care in uh, these patients. And uh, so basically, I think, you know, everyone, it's almost mandatory at every pathology lecture you give, you have to use the word personalised medicine and talk about doing mutations. You had a list of all these mutations on one side and actionable targets, you know, treatments that you could potentially give and the incidence of these mutations. So the premise of the IMPACT trial is that we'll look at the top three, you know, readily available mutations. One is this uh, BRCA mismatch, uh, you know, homologous recombination repair deficient pathway, which uh, only 4% will have mutations, but maybe 30% will have the pangenomic instability. We'll look at HER2 amplification, which we know only occurs in 1% to 2% of pancreatic cancer, but, you know, Herceptin uh, is a great drug that's worked very well for breast cancer, and case reports are responding quite well in pancreatic cancer. And we'll look at patients which are wild type for KRAS, for which there are good reasons to think that they'll respond to a lot of NIB. So they're the three cohorts which you know, we would think would account for about 30% of patients. And there are other potential uh, uh, targets there, but the idea is to sequence those, you know, look for those three mutations. So this is an outline of the original IMPACT trial, and this was funded for $1.5 million uh, by the government funders. And the basic uh, outline is it shows that Patients, you know, with males or females with confirmed or de novo metastatic or recurrent pancreatic adenocarcinoma, then they need to enrol in the trial, makes sense. Uh, they have to confirm eligibility. And uh, we're looking for those specific mutations, which are HER2 amplification, repair, uh, homologous recombination re uh, repair deficient tumours, so the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. Um, or if they're wild type for KRAS, and uh, they will be randomised into standard treatment gemcitabine or treatment guided by the individual mutation, and then we'll see whether the patients progress or respond or die. So it's sort of a logical way of doing this, but what actually happened in the real world in clinical practice in this $1.5 million trial? There were 93 patients uh, consented for molecular testing. We had a gold of consent 100, so that's good. So, uh, however, of those patients, significant, uh, significant numbers uh, weren't able to get tissue uh, sequenced. Some of them, uh, literally, the tissue was unable to be retrieved from the um, initial reporting college department, or it was diagnosed by fine needle aspiration alone with no uh, cell block preparation, which you know initially we had as a not being eligibility criteria, uh, or the patients didn't want another biopsy and so forth. So that left 76 patients of the 93 who had tissue available for molecular testing. And there were two cases where basically we were just unable to extract enough DNA for molecular testing, well that's to be expected in this sort of study. 74 samples actually went on for molecular testing and then we had another couple of cases where, although we thought we had enough DNA, by a next generation sequencing approach, we had too many holes in the, in the genome to uh, fully classify the tumours. But out of that group, we were able to find 22 eligible patients, which is a little bit less than the one third that we thought, but 22 patients who had either the KRAS wild type, the HER2 amplification, or the uh, homologous recombination repair deficiency. So you'd think that would be enough to um, to uh, 
analyse, uh, you know, have a worthwhile result. But what happened to those 22 patients? Well, the whole process of molecular testing in the routine clinical setting took a lot longer than thought it. So about half of them died or progressed to ECOG status 2, which is you know, basically being too sick to be enrolled in the trial, before the results were ready and the patients were able to be delivered standard treatment. Another about a third started chemotherapy before the result was available with standard chemotherapy, which is demcitabine, which made them ineligible by the terms of the trial. About a fifth objected to randomization, so they just wanted the best available treatment uh, regardless of the randomization process. And uh, the others were ineligible uh, you know, for the reasons that we outlined. So on the bottom line of this $1.5 million trial, where 93 patients were enrolled, no patients received active treatment or received a drug on this trial. So you could say that's a failure, although I'd like to think of it as uh, we've learned a lot from it, and so it's a success, <laughs> even if it shows you uh, how things uh, uh, shouldn't be done. And I just want to acknowledge, uh, again, this is only a part of which I'm a small contributor uh, in quite a large group and acknowledge you know, all the people, particularly Andrew Biankin and uh, Sean Grimman, who really led uh, this project. And uh, that's all I had. I thought I had some photos of Marlon. I caught it must be on my other USB stick. I'll show it later. <laughs>